All right, so we're going to go ahead and get started with some announcements. Um, so we do offer CME today. Um, we're providing CME credits to attendees today, so please make sure you complete the provided CME forms provided at your location and print clearly, clearly or you may not receive credit for attending. Um, today, our topic is Medical Marijuana 101 with an emphasis on HIV. Our presenter today is Trisha Reed. She's the lead pharmacist for Columbia Care New York and the general manager of their Manhattan location. She graduated from Purdue University and has over 15 years of retail pharmacy industry experience. After witnessing firsthand the opioid epidemic, she became very interested in medical marijuana and has since developed a deep passion for it. Dr. Reed has been very active in physician education, presenting at Mount Sinai's annual neuropathic pain CME, speaking at an NYU journal club, accompanying Assemblyman Godfried on an educational medical marijuana panel hosted by the Friars Club, as well as hosting monthly physician education evenings at the Manhattan Dispensary. Uh, so please welcome Dr. Reed. Thank you so much for having me today. So I'm gonna talk about Medical Marijuana 101 um, with an emphasis on HIV. Um, explain the medical marijuana program in New York, um, as well as the pharmacology of the plant, um, and then how you would dose it and prescribe it to your patients. This is just a disclosure statement saying that nothing is um, approved by the FDA or DEA. So Columbia Care is um, dedicated to setting the standard of care for medical marijuana. We are located in nine states, um, and that number is growing rapidly. Um, we're applying for licenses in multiple other states as we speak. In New York, we have four dispensaries. There's 19 registered, sorry, 19 dispensaries statewide, five registered organizations. Each registered organization is allowed to have four dispensaries. So these are where our four dispensaries are located in New York. And in New York, it's a very, um, our program is very different in the sense that we have to grow our own product, we manufacture our own product, and then we distribute and dispense our own products. So we grow all of our product up in a cultivation center up in Rochester, New York, goes through um, CO2 extraction, then it goes through a testing process in-house, and then it's sent to a lab uh, mandated by the state, Wadsworth Labs. Uh, we have a 5% variability rate, uh, whereas most generic companies have a 10% variability rate. In New York, there's 11 qualifying conditions. Chronic pain was newly added um, just two weeks ago. Neuropathy, cancer, spinal cord injury, inflammatory bowel disease, MS, epilepsy, Parkinson's, HIV, ALS, and Huntington's. And each of these qualifying conditions must be accompanied by an associated condition. So severe pain, muscle spasms, nausea, cachexia, and seizures are those conditions. There's about 16,000 registered patients in the state of New York right now. Um, that number is growing as chronic pain just got added. Um, and 935 registered practitioners. So in order to get registered as a practitioner, you t simply take a four-hour CME course. Um, you register with the Department of Health, and then you're ready to start prescribing, or recommending, I should say. It's not an actual prescription. Um, and for the patients, they contact a registered physician to get certified. The physician prints out a, an eight and a half by 11 sheet um, certificate. I'll show you an example um, as we go. Then they can apply online for their state ID card and then make an appointment at one of the dispensaries to come in. So when a patient comes into a dispensary, they have their certificate and their ID card. 
They check in with um, a security guard at the front door. They'll check in like a normal doctor's office. Um, and then they wait to be seen on their first appointment by a pharmacist. Um, we do an in, in-depth consultation with the patient. Um, we discuss all of their symptoms, their current medications, their marijuana history, um, the ratio of appropriateness and benefits, and, the, and how to use the actual products. So what makes cannabis medicine? Cannabinoids are the organic chemicals in the marijuana plant that have the pharmacological properties. There's over 500 compounds in the plant and at least 85 of those are cannabinoids. THC and CBD are the two most prevalent cannabinoids. So how does cannabis work in our body? So we produce endogenous, step back, sorry. So our body produces endogenous cannabinoids. We can get cannabinoids from plants, and then there's also synthetic pharmaceutical derived cannabinoids. They attach to endocannabinoid receptors, CB1, CB2, and TRPV1. And the endocannabinoid system is involved in regulating a variety of physiological processes, appetite, pain, pleasure, immune system, mood, and memory. So the three cannabinoid receptors, CB1, CB2, and TRPV1, um, all make up the endocannabinoid system. CB1 is highly expressed in the brain and CNS. It's responsible for neurotransmitter release. It's not prevalent in the brain stem, which may account for the lack of deaths related to, to marijuana. And it's 10 times more prevalent in the CNS as compared to the mu opioid receptor. Should I pause until this comes back up? Okay, we're good now. Um, CB2 is highly expressed in the immune cells and responsible for the immune responses and anti-inflammatory properties. And TRPV1 is also highly expressed in the CNS and responsible for inflammation. So THC is a CB1 and CB2 agonist. It has the psychoactive component of the plant it provides an opiate type pain relief, appetite stimulant, um, good for nausea, sleep, muscle relaxation, and can be opiate sparing, reducing withdrawal symptoms from opiates. CBD is a CB1 and CB2 antagonist and a TRPV1 agonist. It's the non-psychoactive cannabinoid, or I like to call it the non-impairing. It does treat anxiety, so we can't say completely non-psychoactive. However, it's non-impairing. Provides neuropathic pain relief and is a great anti-inflammatory. Good for anxiety, cytotoxic effects. It's also good for some muscle relaxation um, and seizures. So the plant has what's called the entourage effect. There's lots of different cannabinoids in the plant. THC and CBD being the two most prevalent, and they have synergy. So they work well in, in the presence of one another. So all of the ratios in New York will always have some component of THC and CBD. This entourage effect is the main reason that organic marijuana is, has been shown to be more effective than the pharmaceutical synthetics. This just kind of shows a range of our um, ratios and how it would kind of treat these symptoms and, and why you would pick one ratio versus another. So in New York, Columbia Care personally has about 5,000 patients and about 3% of those patients are HIV patients. Most of them presenting with severe chronic pain cachexia or nausea, it's their main associated conditions. And they mainly buy the, the higher THC products, treating those symptoms. So the symptoms treated by cannabis 
in HIV patients would be cachexia, nausea, neuropathic pain, and chronic pain. So there's limited data and research in the U.S., mainly because there was a law in place that only the University of Mississippi could have the contract to actually conduct these trials. But from the trials that we do have, um, we had two blind, sorry, double blind placebo controlled studies with cannabis cigarettes and dronabinol, uh, which showed an increase of caloric intake in both cigarettes and the dronabinol. Um, the follow up study showed that the cigarettes actually increased body weight and dronabinol didn't. So for smoking cannabis, um, it found to reduce HIV-associated daily pain levels significantly. So we looked at two studies, cannabis and painful HIV-associated sensory neuropathy, sample size of 50. Um, the smoked, smoking cannabis group reduced daily pain levels by 34% versus 17% with placebo. And in the, the second study that we looked at, it was a smaller sample size, but 46% had a clinically significant pain relief with cannabis use versus 18% with placebo. 30% of HIV AIDS patients are already using marijuana for medicinal purposes. New York products are tested for microbial, fungals, pesticides, heavy metals. So it would be much safer for them to use our products versus black market. Um, no evidence suggests that cannabis has negative effects on the CD4 counts. And patients have reported overall significant improvements in symptoms and overall quality of life. So how would you pick a ratio for your patient? We base the ratios just on the symptoms and main complaints. So we also ask what medications they're taking um, to kind of correlate the dosing frequency as well, um, how often they're taking those medications to treat those symptoms. We also ask about their history with marijuana, if they're THC naive or not. Um, we would probably start with a much lower THC if they've never been exposed. And then determine what symptoms THC or CBD would, would best benefit the patient. And this kind of just describes that essentially. So if you have a patient with presenting with more neuropathic pain, inflammation, you would go high CBD. If it's, they're on a lot of opiates and they're trying to get off of the opiates, you may want to incorporate some THC. So you may want to do a one-to-one -one if they're there's a combination of these symptoms. So we have a patient, JW, it's a qualifying condition, it's HIV. Main complaints, severe neuropathic pain, characterized by shooting, stabbing, tingling pain in the, the hands and feet, aching pain in the lower back. Also complains of muscle spasms, insomnia, anxiety, and depression. Current meds are Strybild, gabapentin, Lyrica, Oxycontin, Oxycodone, Fluoxetine, Ambien, and Xanax. Never been exposed to marijuana. So what ratio would be most appropriate? Um, this is actually a very common patient case that we see. Um, the one-to-one -one ratio kind of would benefit him just because it has it can treat the best of both THC, CBD symptoms. However, it could still make you pretty drowsy during the day, especially if he's never been exposed to marijuana. Um, or we could do a combination of two, doing a low THC, high CBD during the daytime, high THC in the evening. High CBD is better prescribed scheduled if it's severe neuropathic pain mainly because there is an accumulation factor with CBD in the bloodstream. So we normally warn patients, you might not see results for one to two weeks 
um, so THC is more of a, a quick fix in terms of treating their pain. So in New York, there's only four different dosage forms approved. There's sublingual tinctures, suspensions or solutions, capsules, and vaporization oils for inhalation. This is just a snapshot of what they kind of look like in New York. Other states do dispense flour, so you would potentially see out in, you know, California or Arizona, patients actually coming home with a bag of marijuana. So here it looks like you're actually going to a, a true pharmacy. They'll have a prescription label on their product when they leave uh, with specific directions. The vaporization oil is the fastest onset of action and it, the shortest duration. So it's very quick in terms of acute pain relief or if you're treating nausea or increasing the appetite, um, but only lasts one to three hours per dose. The sublingual tinctures, if used properly, is still very quick of an onset of action. Um, if it is swallowed, it would it would be up to two hours in terms of onset of action. Um, and the duration of action is four to six hours. The capsules take one to two hours to, to kick in. Uh, they're metabolized through the liver and they last for eight to 10 hours. They're naturally just an extended release. This kind of just shows the intensity of effect of the vaporization is, oil is the blue line, the sublingual tincture is the orange, and the gray is uh, the capsules, showing the onset of action and duration of action. So in New York, you get a dosing recommendation instead of a prescription. On this recommendation, you can have up to three different dosing recommendations. You could essentially do a high CBD, a one-to-one -one ratio, and a high THC. Just if you're not sure what the patient's gonna respond best to, um, that's one way that you could just have them come and we could help them um, in terms of figuring out which one to pick. With each dosing recommendation, the patient can get a 30-day supply. Um, the pharmacist always checks PMP before every dispensing. Um, the patients can, however, purchase less than a 30-day supply, unlike most, um, actually all narcotics. <laughs> and the end date on each dosing recommendation is the date that you would want to see your patient back. So the whole certification is a one-year expiration, but the recommendations have separate expiration dates which would just be, so if you wrote, you wanted them to come back and, and see you and follow up every three months, you would write that out for three months. And we wouldn't, just like any uh, prescription, if it was expired, we would not be able to dispense the patient. So the side effects of, of medical marijuana um, are, basically vary by patient and ratio. If you have more THC, you're probably gonna experience drowsiness or an increase of appetite. High CBD can actually give you an increase of energy or a boost of energy. Um, could also make you more cognitively focused. So that's the non-impairing one. Um, this slide, the, the main thing about this slide is basically saying it's very safe um, and a great alternative so, um, to some of the other medications that you're gonna be using. Drug interactions that we caution for are any drugs metabolized by cytochrome P450. Inhibitors can increase the plasma concentration of THC and CBD and inducers can decrease the concentration, making them less effective. We don't know the extent of these interactions, so we caution patients. So if a patient is taking Coumadin, I'll just um, let them know that they should probably follow up with an INR or 
you know, ask how things have been going and making sure that they're controlled at the moment. Um, same with diabetes medications, um, just letting them know there's a chance of hypoglycemia. And then with any opiates or hypnotics or benzos um, and alcohol, it can make you either extra impaired or extra sleepy. And I went through that kind of fast. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, but there's lots of time for questions and answers, if anyone has any. Um, yes, so we have a lot of time uh, for discussion. Um, so if we can pull up the different sites. Um, so I'm going to start out with St. Luke's um, to see if anyone has any comments or questions. Are they unmuted? Hi, Chris. Does anyone have any questions or? Uh, I can hear you now. Okay. Um, I actually have, I have a question about legality um, because we, I run our peer, I run our peer program, and um, at Mount Sinai, nobody can have marijuana in their system. Um, that was something that everyone gets tested, and I wanted to hire some people who were in a program, I don't know if they were in your program, obviously they would have had to provide documentation, but are you looking into sort of figuring out ways to work with employers so that if people, like we're trying to hire people who are HIV positive who are dealing with their pain actively in a way that you know might make more sense than something that's a little bit um, harder on their system like opioids, but um, we weren't able to hire those people. So is, that's kind of like a more policy question, but I'm very interested in hearing your response. Sure. Um, in terms of the employer side of things, we're, we are a little bit more removed in that regard. However, the same way. Hi, folks. Hi. If, if folks could hold their comments, so because um, we can hear all the background noise because everybody's off mute. So in terms of, um, you know, being hired with it in your system, I think that's still, there's still a lot of work to be done in that regards. Um, there has been some states that have released, um, if your blood levels are under a certain, I think it's five nanograms per milliliter, then it, you would be suitable for either driving or being employed, however, that's still very, very variable because you don't know if they've just taken a capsule when they've been tested and it's going to kick in two hours later, not in the bloodstream yet. So that is something um, I would say in terms of policy. I would, it would be the same as letting pa you know patients work while taking opioids um, as long as they're not physically impaired would be. I don't know how you would write that into the actual policy, though. Um, I have a quick question. Can you hear me? Yeah. So let's finish with St. Luke's, okay. and then we'll come back down to Mount Sinai oh. West. Go ahead. OK, go ahead. OK. Um, so this was actually a topic um, on Late Night Tonight with John Oliver. He had a really interesting medical marijuana program or bit on his show. And he actually interviewed one of, he actually interviewed like the, the principal investigator at the University of Mississippi. And it, you know, he talked about how this is the only research site that's actually like licensed or, or accredited to do this. Do you think that will open up? I mean, I just think kind of like with my research hat on and how limited that is to sort of like inform practice and inform policy to sort of limit one research center with possibly its own agenda or possibly its own research questions. Do you think there will be any sort of future directions to, I don't know, diversifying who's actually doing this type of research and what kind of the research questions are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was actually a bill passed in 2016 um, allowing more universities to 
to participate in research. So Columbia Care specifically, we are working with a couple universities in New York, um, already trying to get some research done with our products. Um, our products are the only products in the U.S. that are controlled dosing, so I think the research will be much more precise and better. Um, and we'll open up just a ton of opportunity in, in terms of research here. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments from St. Luke's before we move on? Great, so I'm gonna move it over to Mount Sinai West. Looks like we have a couple of questions. Interactions with the HIV medicines and how to, if you have any guidance in terms of somebody yeah. starting being a site of people get the injection. Yes, um, definitely. Those the CYP P450 um, enzymes. I know a lot of the ARVs um, do interact. Um, there was a statement released that the pharmacokinetics showing the interactions didn't actually. Um, Sorry, um, lost my train of thought. So they didn't actually affect the ARV therapy in terms of the effectiveness. It was more based on the THC, CBD effectiveness side. So I think there's still a lot of research to be done. I think that in terms of um, what they do know about not affecting CD4 counts, there's actually a study, um, I believe it was based out of Harvard, that showed CD4 counts were actually improving um, with the use of marijuana, which was very interesting. So it, it's a caution to look out for, but it's not a contraindication. Great. And if folks would mind, if you're speaking, if you could mute um, so we can hear the other conversations. Um, Uh, notice in uh, the patient that you the, uh, uh, had was um, uh, he was taking a witch's brew, assuming it's a he, of uh, uh, analgesic medications, fentanyl, yes. benzos. I, I mean, I couldn't even write down a list. Now, who, she, it seems to me to add one other medication is a real problem, number one. Number two, uh, there should be some centralizing, you know, the, probably the primary care physician to say, hey, we have to slowly modify uh, your regimen. Is there any mechanism under the Columbia Care dispensing uh, to uh, do this? Because in isolation, I think that it it's a uh, recipe for clinical failure. Yeah, actually, the goal is, is actually to reduce the amount of medications. Um, so I work with patients all the time and, and counsel them. I work with their physicians as well in terms of how aggressive, if they want to decrease their opioids, um, or if they're having terrible side effects from something like Lyrica, that they would actually we would work with them, and this would be a replacement therapy. Um, they're, they normally come to us for a reason in, in the sense that their current therapies, they have a whole cocktail, they aren't working. I just want to add one thing. Opio there's no evidence that opioids are effective for HIV neuropathic pain. That's true. It's not. But they're used a lot because they're, I think that the doctors are, or prescribers are pushed into a situation where they're trying to get pain relief for their patients and, and that's what they end up using. But this is, this is a common regimen that we see in our patients and we, yeah. Um, but they're not working, and so then they get, you know, they get addicted, and then that's why they end up with, you know, the dispensary, and we're helping them get off of them. Can you maybe talk about what ended up happening with that patient that you showed us for the case? I mean, what, what, what was the regiment that changed based on them starting your product? 
So we went with the high CBD ratio for daytime scheduled um, in a scheduled dosing and then a high THC vapor for acute pain relief. And the patient was able to decrease their Lyrica and Gabapentin. They've reduced all opioids. They've reduced Ambien and Xanax. So the only thing that they're currently still taking is Strybild and Fluoxetine. I actually have two questions. One is on coverage and cost, and the other one is uh, what would be your recommendation in terms of coverage among providers? Like, you know, we have a practice with nine um, providers, seven are part-timers, and let's say if one or two of the providers are certified but not others, it was my understanding that the prescription can be good for months. So if it's not like opiates that you know we cannot give refills. So I'm not sure the logistics of uh, how would it work and how other practices are doing. So most of the, I'll answer the second question first. Most of the physicians are writing for about three months out and having them follow up. However, we have we do have quite a few that are giving a full year prescription. Um, which allows them to come for a 30-day supply, or they can come because it is out of pocket. Um, we aren't seeing as much abuse. It's very, it is, can get very expensive. Um, however, that is a limitation. So the average monthly cost is between two and three hundred dollars per month. Um, we do have, so the vaporization oil, if you are just using it as needed, um, comes in a, a pre-filled cartridge and it's dispensed for $100 and that could potentially last a patient a month. It just depends on how they can ration it essentially, um, but it can get very expensive if they are trying to really reduce all of their other, other opiates, hypnotics, benzos, that sort of thing. That could get very expensive, um, but we have seen it done with smaller doses. Uh, what's the difference in potency between this and Marinol, which we can prescribe right now? So Marinol is five milligrams of THC or 10 milligrams THC. Our products um, come, depending on the ratio, um, they're a mixture of the two THC and CBD, but our high THC is five milligrams per capsule of THC. So pretty equivalent. Um, however, it, it may feel stronger with the CBD component there, the entourage effect, the, the CBD really helps to activate the THC and make it more effective. I just had one question before we move on. So you, you keep saying physician. Are physicians the only people disciplined that can make recommendations versus a nurse practitioner or a PA? My apologies. So I, I have been trying to retrain myself to say practitioner um, or prescriber because it's either MD, DO, NPs, and PAs can all now um, prescribe or recommend. Um, PAs were just added two weeks ago, and NPs were added um, a couple months ago. Great. Thanks for that clarification. So I'm going to move up to 275 to see if there's any questions or comments. You want? We can talk about barriers to access, I guess. I know that you mentioned the cost, um, and I'm just wondering if there are um, if you could talk a little bit more about how, um, how the barriers to access are being addressed. So we do offer a 15% discount to any patients um, on Medicaid, Medicare, that are veterans, on disability. Um, that's just a private discount. Um, there is a um, program set up for um, someone in our dis 
in Columbia Care nationwide will sponsor patients. So we have a few patients that um, can't afford it at all that have applied to be um, sponsored essentially. And so someone in our company will sponsor a patient and pay for their monthly medication. Any other questions from 275? No, I think that's all our questions. Um, thank you very much. It was a good, yeah, great presentation. Great. So I'm going to move to Peter Kruger to see if there's any questions or comments. No. No? No? Okay. And now I'm going to move to Jack Martin. No? Okay. Great. Um, any final thoughts that you want to impart? I know that we have some hard copy packets here at Mount Sinai West um, for the attendees here, and I think you're going to send something. Yeah, I'll be sending a PDF of our prescriber packets that just um, explain our products specifically, how to dose them, um, and all the details to go with that of what we offer. Great. And how would folks get in touch with you if they had additional questions? Um, so. Charissa will have the full PDF, and she also has my email address. Um, but if you want to write it down, it's tread at col-care.com, um, and you can send me an email. Great. So thank you for your presentation. Since we're ending a little early, um, you'll want to make sure you only claim uh, the time that we were here today on your CME form. So thank you very much. All right, thank you.